Uh, our next speaker will be uh, Dr. Nita Leterapang. Uh, Nita is an assistant professor of medicine in the section of general medicine here at the university and also is the associate director for translational and policy research of chronic diseases, uh, working with Dr. Albert Wang. Uh, Dr. Leterapang attended medical school at Boston University and completed an internal medicine residency and a master of science in health studies here at the university. In, 19, in 2012, she joined the faculty here in the Department of Medicine. Um, as a clinical investigator, Dr. Leterapong is committed to improving physical and mental health outcomes for patients with chronic diseases. Her research also has focused on individualizing care for adults with diabetes. The Buxbaum Institute is proud to have named Dr. Dr. Leterapong as a Buxbaum Junior Faculty Scholar. Today, Nada Leterapong will speak to us on the importance of increasing behavioral health care in primary care. Nada. Thank you. So thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm really honored. Um, uh, thankfully, I have some funding, but I don't have any disclosures. So I am leading, um, for several years, the Primary Care Behavioral Health Integration Program. And this is an overarching program here at the university, which leads and directs innovations aimed at advancing behavioral health care for patients who receive care at the DCAM Primary Care Group, which is uh, the general medicine, medicine pediatrics practice here at the University of Chicago. And um, it's a team of leaders. So Daniel Hanna, who's pictured here, is the interim chair of Psych the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neuroscience. Lisa Vinci is the medical director for the primary care group and associate vice chair of, of ambulatory operations. Nancy Beckman is the director of health psychology. And Aaron Staub is our project manager who glues us all together. It's like herding cats. Um, so why integrate behavioral care, uh, primary care and behavioral health care? It's important for those of you who are not working in this space to understand what behavioral health care is, is, what that means. And it includes what you would expect traditional mental health care to include, the care of patients with depression and anxiety, but also interventions aimed at improving health behaviors. So I don't know about you, but I have to exercise more. I have to eat better. And the behavioral health care allows you to have people who are trained in motivational interviewing and other methods to help improve those health behaviors. So it probably can seem a little bit obvious that the number of people who need to improve their health behaviors is large. And so it's not surprising that there's a shortage of behavioral health providers in the U.S. and worldwide. There's never going to be enough psychiatrists, social workers, therapists, psychologists, counselors to go around. In addition, a lot of people are not willing or excited to see patients or to see providers in those settings. In addition, clinical trials have shown that integrating Behavioral health and primary care in the same setting improves both physical and mental health outcomes and is cost effective and in some cases cost savings. So there's a lot of good reasons to do this. So what's the spectrum of primary care and behavioral health care integration? Many places historically have been just coordinated. So you talk, behavioral health providers and primary care providers talk when necessary. Other places are co-located, where these two sets of providers actually sit in the same physical space and mostly communicate about shared patients. And what's great about that is you can do something called a warm handoff, where it's like a transfer of trust. The patient trusts the primary care doctor. The patient's having a tough day, tough week, tough month. And they can, the primary care provider can grab that counselor, therapist, psychologist, or psychiatrist even in some settings to start that therapeutic relationship today. Get your therapy today rather than having to come back, doubt that you want to go, and then not show up. Also, and then the most advanced form is what's called integrated care, and there's lots of different models for this, um, but it's mostly team-based, collaborative treatment planning. Behavioral health providers and primary care providers are on the same page, often working off of registries, calling patients even if they didn't show up for appointments, trying to make sure patients are being managed as a population, not just when they show up to clinic. So where have we been and where are we going? So in 2015, um, 
University of Chicago, psychiatry and internal medicine are pretty much siloed and separate and just providing coordinated care. And we received, our team received a University of Chicago Center for Healthcare Delivery Science and Innovation Award to develop the first program that was really aimed at depression screening and management. We specifically targeted the Medicare Advantage population because this was one of the first major capitated contracts here at the University of Chicago where we were at risk for a population. And we were actually using a tool developed by Robert Gibbons, a biostatistician here, that um, used computerized adaptive testing methods to assess mental health conditions. But when we got started, we realized our problem was much bigger than just Medicare Advantage. In primary care, we basically, as I said, were starting from scratch. So We've done two major innovation, in, in, excuse me, initiatives over the last several years. The first one was really to focus on increasing access to behavioral health care. Access in the sense of training up our primary care providers to do more mental health care, and also trying to get more resources physically in place in our clinic. So we developed and piloted a Medicare Advantage Collaborative Care Program, and this program has really spun off and become the ACT team, if you're familiar with it, which is for high utilizers, um, for the ACO populations, people who've got Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance and Medicare insurance, um, and they have special behavioral health care managers as part of their team for people who are high utilizers and have mental health conditions. We also established the primary care group behavioral medicine clinic. So far, it's been a part-time behavioral medicine clinic available four and a half days a week, where we have health psychologists with interns, externs, and postdocs who are available for brief appointments, meaning 30 minutes, not the typical hour-long sessions you would do in therapy, for five to eight sessions. In addition, you could do also the warm handoffs. Um, and the plans are to grow that practice as we are currently looking for a full-time health psychologist. Um, and then also we develop clinical and patient resources available at the point of care, in the clinic rooms, on the, in the physician work rooms, um, as well as in EPIC, our electronic health record, and online. And the types of resources for the physicians are actually decision support tools. How do you screen someone for depression? What do you do if someone's positive? What medications do you start? So we did that for depression, anxiety, panic, ADHD, and um, we also have a suicide decision aid. And then we also spent a lot of time working with our psychiatry colleagues to try to understand the referral process. What happens when people you put that referral into psychiatry? Where does that go? Who processes it? How are patients contacted? And then we worked as we could, as well as we could, in streamlining that process. But that's a work in progress. And then the second initiative, after we felt like we could support our doctors if they identified someone with depression, was to actually implement population-wide depression screening. Okay, so results. Um, this gets me very excited. I love results. So, um, so this is a survey that we've done at three time points and basically are doing annually at this point, which measures the level of integration perceived by our clinical staff as well as our providers and how well we all work together, primary care and behavioral health care. So higher scores are better. Um, and in blue, you have baseline, which was right after we got the innovation award, then six months later, and then 18 months. What you can see is overall, when um, our scores have gotten better, um, and across, I'm just featuring four of the six domains that are in the survey, um, integration, the relationship between providers, and training all got better. Um, beliefs and commitment took a little dip, and then it got, came up a little bit. And in general, well-integrated clinics have a score of about 80 or above. So we're making progress, and we're quite happy about it. And we're actually launching our next survey this month to see how well we're doing at this point. And this is our data for primary care group depression screening. So we turned on something called the best practice alert, which many of you um, who are clinical know what those are. Um, those are reminders that are passive, that patients should have some sort of screening test or other thing. Um, and we turned it on in February 2016, and we just turned it on. Um, and at the time, there were some early adopters. About 10% of people were willing to use it. Um, and then in July, we started trying to see, well, how can we move the needle on this? So we started sending monthly reports to attending physicians that had unblind peer ratings. So you could see in that month how many people you screened for depression who was eligible compared to your peers. 
And so that actually, we only do that for attendings, and in our clinic, attendings see about half of the patients um, in primary care and residents see the other half. So you can start to see that the, the, the needle did move up, and for most of the, the months, when compared to residents, it was a significant improvement. And then in September 2017, we were able to train all of our medical assistants, and we actually implemented medical assistant depression screening, which is done across the country in many practices, where the medical assistant during their triage process screen for depression. And you can see that um, they took on the task um, very willingly, um, and at just turning it on, allowing them to do that, training them and getting the workflow set, um, they've been screening at about 55 to 60 percent rate since then. So we're very excited about this. The reason this is important is without screening systematic for depression, primary care providers, study after study, only identify 50 percent of people with depression, and they only adequately treat people about half the time too. So it's a huge problem, and it's been recognized by the United uh, the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force as something that primary care providers should be doing every year for patients, and it's also an ACO quality measure and a HEDIS quality measure. So in summary, um, the Primary Care Group Behavioral Health Integration Program, I hope I've shown you it's de demonstrated success in advancing the integration of primary care and behavioral health care and improving depression care at the University of Chicago. And one thing that um, I've learned from this process is that advancing this integration is complicated and very much requires a multi-stakeholder team and alignment with clinical missions doesn't hurt either. So it's a big team to acknowledge and thank you. Owen. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, for those of you who didn't hear, um, in oncology they have a similar screening program and their question is, or Owen's question is, to what degree are providers aware of the screening and are they acting on the positive screens, I assume. So um, we have, we're aware of this problem. So we actually had initially started uh, with the medical assistants using the electronic health record, screening the patient in the electronic health record, and writing down on the intake form, the counter form, like a positive screen or not. Um, not all the physicians identified it. I followed it for about a month, and I contacted physicians who didn't complete the depression screening. So there's basically two questions. We're using the PHQ-2. PHQ they would do two questions, and the physician should have finished the next seven questions. And if the next seven questions weren't completed, I emailed the physician and said, hey, did you realize that the person screened positive? And there were about 30 times it was not complete. Um, and there were five to 10, I can't remember, times that the physician was unaware. And so what we then moved on to was a paper, good old-fashioned paper form where it's a bright blue depression screening form, and the medical assistants leave it there for the doctor. So you see it when you walk in that the person's screening test is, you know, the results are right there. So um, we feel like paper sometimes is better than technology, and that's how we've closed that loop. But it's an important problem. Yeah. Computerized adaptive testing tends to be very costly, particularly for sections or programs such as oh. Oh, thank you. Um, tends to be very costly. So the long-term kind of um, cost risks and or savings, if you could speak to that long-term. Yeah, so the question is about computerized adaptive testing and the costs of implementing. So, so what I would say is that definitely brief screeners are faster and they're cheaper and they're free. Adaptive testing requires cloud-based technology, which requires financial support to support the network and especially with advancements. Um, so the... So I think it depends um, on where you are and where you practice and to what degree that's those patients who have that problem are a sizable chunk of your population. Um, the great thing about adaptive testing is that you can administer a whole battery of them and it, the test can adapt such that you're not just screening for one condition at a time. You can screen for multiple conditions and at risk. And, and so, I think it, I, so I think it is the way of the future but I'm not sure if health systems are going to be in charge of adopting the cost. Um, who's in charge of the cost of, of doing all the work? And so, yeah. 
So in primary care, we're not using it yet. And, and you know, um, the one specifically I'm talking about is Robert Gibbons' tool, and we're still working on integrating it into the electronic health record. Is this a national trend, or are we in the process? Yeah, so the question is, are, is this a national trend? And I think you mean integrating behavioral health care and primary care, or are we, or act, or are we actually at the forefront? Um, so we are um, not laggards. Um, we are, I would say we're in the, not the, we're not the first either. We're kind of in the middle, front of the middle, I would say. Um, I, you know, across academic medical centers, um, you know, the work that our team is doing is really kind of pushing the envelope on things, and we're right up there. But we are not the people who did the clinical trials. Some of the clinical trials that established these methods are from, you know, 10 years ago or so. But the implement the complex process of implementing them into healthcare systems, that part we are at the forefront for. Deepu. Tina, this is really important work. Um, do you, thinking about the jump you had when you had the medical assistants doing this, do you think the biggest barrier is time with the patient or do you think that it is, the, the, in light of the number of follow-up questions that weren't completed, is there a, an issue with comfort level and what do I do if this patient, you know, what's the next step, find their, they screen positive, then what do I do? Yeah, so great question. Um, and something that our team is struggling with because our goal is to hit 75% of 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 uh, eligible patients by July. Um, so what we found is that in primary care, there's med the medical assistants would love to do this if they had more time to do it. So if, if we had adequate staffing of medical assistants in our clinic, that would be a huge win and allow them to do all the important things they need to do. Not only depression screening, while this is you know, near and dear to my heart, they, there's other things that need to be done. Checking blood pressures a second time if the first one's high is, a, you know, institutional priority. But that takes time, and who has the time? Um, and so there are a lot of things that need to get done. And so um, definitely when the clinics are busier or when people are unable to make it to work, and so there's few, it's short-staffed, then depression screening is one of the first things to go. The providers do know that it's an expectation to do depression screening, but there are many things that we're supposed to be doing. So the nice thing, the one thing I would say also is if you um, follow the Healthy Planet sort of, you know, what proportion of the University of Chicago primary care patients are getting in general as an entity are getting depression screening, the numbers look much lower than this. And that's because that's at a population level, including people who haven't come to clinic. So, you, you know, currently we don't screen people for depression if they're just out there as well as someone who's come to the University of Chicago in the past. So those numbers look closer to 30 percent, whereas our numbers look closer to 60 percent. And as people come back to clinic, um, you know, hopefully we'll move that 30 percent up. 